Few things are more peaceful in the garden than the sound of moving water and the many reflections that we get off a pond. Today we explore the amazing world of water gardening. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart in Georgia. Gardeners have been using Seven for over 50 years. Seven is designed to kill a wide variety of insects, like Japanese beetles, tomato hornworms, and aphids. Hate the bugs, love the garden. Seven, available at garden centers near you. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. Jaguar F-Pace. Water has been an essential element of gardens from the beginning of time, and its importance is evident in every garden that we visit. The sense of peacefulness that emanates from its very presence is felt by every visitor. It reminds us that it is the source of life itself on our small planet. It attracts a host of wildlife and provides us a natural mirror to reflect the beauty of all that surrounds it. Today we visit a garden that was built around a series of natural ponds that are connected by streams, waterfalls, and natural shoals. The water features are the foundation of the garden, and there are very few corners you can visit without hearing or seeing it. The garden we visit today is the home of Jim Gibbs. Jim has spent the better part of the past 40 years building this paradise in the North Georgia mountains. It has been an incredible endeavor and a true labor of love. Today we'll be learning from his lifetime of experience how to build and maintain water gardens and how to get the most out of aquatic plants. Jim, welcome back. Thanks so much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Today we're going to talk about water gardening, and this is one of the hottest topics in gardening. Our viewers are asking questions about it all the time. There's tremendous interest in it, and for obvious reasons. Water adds so much to a garden, whether it's the sound of this waterfall behind us, you know, the visual aesthetics, the fact that it brings wildlife into the garden, and just all the natural reflections that we get off of it. It's really impactful. Of course, everyone, as you said, loves water. I knew that when I decided to build a world-class garden. The first thing, because we had water restrictions in Atlanta in 1973, I began to search for an abundance of water, and then I knew that I wanted to build a lot of ponds. We have 29 ponds here. I wanted to have bridge crossings, which are fun and exciting. I wanted to make sure that we had waterfalls and we had moving water. We had, even if it's a trickle of water, people love that. It also evokes all the senses. Mm -hmm. When you think about water, you hear the sounds that you just mentioned. You can even uh, smell the fragrance of the water lilies in the water lily gardens. It's like water on a coming rain. I can smell it miles away and everybody gets excited over water. So what we wanted to do here was to design the gardens with water being a feature garden. So our water lily garden also serves as reflections we reflect the, the plants, the water lilies, in the water. We have trees and we have shrubs and, and all those ornamental plants that are reflecting water. So water just has so much that can be used for. It's great. It plays a very central role in this garden. Today we're going to focus on a few of the most impressive features that you have. Great. Sounds wonderful. Awesome. We're discussing the importance of reflection in water. And it's often a thing that perhaps we don't take enough advantage of in garden design. And perhaps we forget about the fact that the water, especially when the conditions are right, 
becomes a completely new canvas. And we can, we can basically project images on that. It really adds a whole additional layer of depth to the garden. And a lot of the purpose of this bridge was to, to capture the reflection. It, it, the bridge is beautiful on its own, but also there's something almost magical about the reflection. I visited Monet's garden, and when I visited his garden the first time, I was so excited over water lilies and the bridge and the reflections of not just the water lilies and the water, but the trees, the canvas. Then when you read about Monet, which is my favorite impressionistic mm. artist, of course he painted for light and reflections. And the more I read about him, you know, for him to be able to see that light down in the water and to paint those reflections deep within the water, like the, the cypress trees growing and they go down, it's just a big mirror of what you see as you look out. But while I was there, I was so fascinated and I decided when I built Gibbs Gardens as a world-class garden, I wanted to go to Monet's garden and actually measure hmm. the radius of his bridge. And I did that. So this is an exact replica. So I measured the radius from right here where this post enters the bridge. And I did it there and there and they gave me the arch. So I picked up the radius. Then I roll the steel for each of these rails. Then I roll the steel for the arbor up above. By the time I finished, there is no question, this is the most expensive piece of sculpture <laughs> that Gibbs Gardens has. Now, also, as you know, he planted purple and white wisteria, and that's what we have growing on the arbor above. So I measured the length of his bridge, and I decided we had to build an island to support it, and that's why he had the island. So, of course, you have the connection of the land here with the island. But the island, of course, gave us a great place to put the Japanese maples, the beautiful uh, Chinese fringe trees, and of course, to display more plant material. Now, if you look around the garden itself, you're dealing with a horizontal plane, that's the water. So you want to try to add some iris and some purple pickerel to give you a vertical to break that up. But if you look out there, look how beautiful the pickerel and the iris reflect in the water as well as the sky. Notice the clouds as they pass over, as they float. They're floating on the water, so you get that wonderful movement. So it was an exciting place to visit, and everyone that comes to Gibbs Gardens now says, well, it's so wonderful because they don't have to make that long trip to Paris and then go <laughs> out to Giverny, but I can actually see the exact replica of that bridge here at Gibbs Gardens. It's amazing. Yeah. Well done. The Japanese garden at Gibbs Garden is by far and away the most impressive, I think, of all the signature gardens. And as you enter into here, you, you feel almost like time slowing down. There's like a, a, a wonderful tranquility to it. You know, even, even the water feels like it's moving more slowly in this garden than it does in other places. You don't have big assertive waterfalls. It's a place that's designed for everyone just to take a deep breath and, and enjoy the scenery. The Japanese garden is a balance of natural and man-made beauty. It's a garden of meditation that delights the senses, all the senses, and it also challenges the soul. And for many when they come, it's a really a spiritual experience. But the Japanese garden was designed, of course, with this water to represent the sea, to represent larger lakes, to make people think back as they travel to different places, or you would look at the water and think of a river, but water evokes all, the senses are all around you, this fragrance of that wonderful viscosa mosaic that's very, very fragrant. But as we look at it, it's all back to what we mentioned before, water, you've got the plants, and you've got the stones, and they're all representative. So as you look across this, uh, every view will be different. If you're on the north side, totally different than the south. Same with the east and the west. So you want to just tour around the garden. This is a stroll garden. So we're now strolling around the ponds. It's a hill and stroll garden, which is a skiama. The skiama, we've been through the hill section. Now we're strolling around the ponds. Unlike many Western gardens, there it's, it seems that almost every element in a Japanese garden has some kind of significance. You were mentioning the rock. As you and I walk through the garden, you have a story about the significance of each one of these rocks. Can you tell us a few? Well, every rock in the garden uh, is, is symbolic. And the, they, the Japanese believe that the 
Awakura gods live within the stones. And when you go out to find stones, you want to make sure that you don't ever disturb the stone. You can't scratch it because you'll disturb the gods that live within the mm. stone. So all the stones in this garden had to be wrapped with burlap and the backhoe lifted them up, put them on a big truck bed, brought them in, and then we had to place all the stones. Now there's a book that tells about all the stones, the shape and the form, and there's a drawing. So you have to search. I searched for five years wow. in five counties finding all these stones, but they all have a, a name. This is the venerable seat rock right mm. here. You've got uh, the rock of never aging. Of course, everybody likes to touch the rock of never aging. <laughs> Beside that rock is the rock of the spirit kings. And that embodies all three of the forces, vertical forces, horizontal and diagonal forces within one stone. And that's the seat of the myriad felicity gods. So every stone that you see, these stones that are floating out, these are actually representing the five islands of Japan. So everything in the Japanese garden is symbolic and very, very difficult to design. Without question, the most difficult garden I have ever designed. And just to do the basic layout was five years in selecting the stones only. And we started working on this garden in 1980, and this is 37 years later. Wow. And it's mature now, but don't forget it takes years of maturity and age and character come with maturity. Of all the water features in a garden, my favorite is the waterfall, and for many obvious reasons. You can hear the sound that's so soothing, and it's a feature that really allows you to feel the movement of the water, and, and there's something that's really soothing about that. And you know, this is a, a feature that is basically denoting a change in, in elevation. That's how we create a waterfall, and so it's transitioning you oftentimes into another part of the garden. Well, not only do we get the sounds of the water, but as the morning light comes in on a waterfall, you get that beautiful sparkle. It almost looks like little diamonds that are glittering. So you've got light playing on water, which is beautiful. Nothing like what you mentioned, sound is without a doubt the most important feature of the waterfall. But of course, people from childhood are excited over waterfalls. And when you hear the waterfall, the sound pulls you to that space. So if the waterfall is at the end of a garden and you hear it in the distance, you're gonna just keep moving to the waterfall because the sound attracts you and you move in that direction. Now here at Gibbs Gardens, we have more than 29 ponds and 19 waterfalls. Wow. The reason we have so many, when I found this property with such an abundance of water, we have springs everywhere. So when we dug down with the track backhoe, if we went down just five feet, we would uncap a little spring that would be like a geyser, maybe shoot water up 12 inches, never stopped running. So we're blessed with the water and with uh, the ponds and with the waterfalls and the streams. We are, this aquifer we are on top of is huge. And the stream in the valley is all spring fed. Every pond is fed by three to five to seven springs. Wow. So you've got waterfalls everywhere. Another advantage that we, we don't oftentimes talk about with waterfalls is the natural evaporative cooling. So as, as water is, is either flowing through a membrane or going over a rock and, and it's interacting with air, it's causing evaporation of that water and, and it actually does not only feel cooler, but it's actually lowering the temperature. It is. Our water temperature because of the springs is 63 degrees. All night these waterfalls are falling water which brings the temperature down. Not only does the water, I mean the air, cool air, flow to the valley and settle, but you've got the waterfalls all night air conditioning the valley. People come here in the mornings, all summer, July, August, will walk with, start out with long sleeve shirts because it's like 66, 67, 68 degrees. That's in July and August when it's hot. So it does have the cooling effect you mentioned. and. Uh, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's just something about all waterfalls are fun and exciting. Jim, we've taken a look at a number of other large-scale water features, and 
course, most of us don't have abundant underwater springs and acres and acres to have little ponds that are connected by waterfalls and creeks. But right here, your koi pond, I think, is an excellent example of a very practical water feature that a homeowner could install. And even if you didn't have this much space, you could install something that was a third that size. And the principles are fairly straightforward. Basically, what we've got here is the elevation change that creates the waterfall. At the top of that, there's a, a small reservoir and then it falls into a larger reservoir. We've got a pump that's going to recirculate the water from the lower reservoir up to the top, and it basically is just a continuous loop. And so then all we've got to think about is what kind of stone we're going to use for, you know, for the ornamentation of it, and then are we going to use a, a, a poly liner or concrete or gunite that's sealed in some way. But they can be fairly easily put together, and the principles behind how we actually make this operate are pretty simple. People come, they see this and think, oh, I could put this in my back garden and it serves its purpose well. But you add a few fish to get a little movement in there. You make sure that you let the stone be cantilevered over the sides. Right. You make sure the walls are vertical so the raccoons can't get in to eat the fish. But if they put their paw in there and can't feel a slope, they will then move to another place. So. Uh, we had problems with raccoons with our big koi pond in the Japanese garden. We have no problems here because these cantilever. But it's a wonderful little example. You hear the water, the sounds of it. You can see the sunlight on it when it changes during the day. But it, people love it. And to me, it's an easy, low maintenance pool. Absolutely. Jim, we discussed some smaller water features and ones that people could install if they had a corner in their backyard. But what if all you have is a brick patio or a very small deck? So you're limited on space, but you still want to take advantage of a water feature. There are things as simple as this rigid black pot here. There's no holes in it, of course, so it holds water. And basically, we'd fill this up with, with water, maybe about two thirds. This is a submergible pump. It's also got some lights on this particular one. And this little fountain, you can adjust this and just makes like a little cone or you can take it out. It'll make, you know, just more gurgling type flow of water sits in there plug this in you've got a water feature in about 15 minutes alternatively you could use the same kind of pump mechanism use something like this this is basically a little fountain or a spitter some people call them and so a hose just plugs into the back of this goes to your pump it can sit on the outside of the water feature so it's just going to leave a little trickle or stream of water it just recirculates it inside this basin. So inside of a very small amount of time with almost no money, you can bring a water feature to a very small space. And they work great on a hot day. That little trickle of water makes it feel much cooler. Absolutely. We looked at a number of options that we could install even in a very small space as far as a water garden goes. Whether we have a, a little patio or, you know, say a decent sized yard, all different kinds of things that we can do with water. But one thing we need to add to the conversation is how we round all of this out and integrate it into the garden with aquatic plants. So it's a whole new vein of horticulture, you know, compared to what we'd have in the ground once we've installed our, our, our water feature. And so looking at what kind of plants could we install in our, in our water garden, you've got a number of really interesting options here. And then also looking at what are the marginal plants that'll, you know, grow on the bank. And then also what kind of trees are gonna perform best around our water feature. Well, here at Gibbs Gardens, of course, we have one of the largest water lily gardens in the nation. We have over 147 varieties. Wow. They're all planted in containers. That way they can't be invasive. If you plant water lilies in the ground of the pond, they will start spreading and you cannot get rid of them. So everyone should know if you want water lilies, always plant them in a container. It's just a black, 24 inch diameter or a 30 inch diameter container. You put your soil in, plant your plants in, that way they're restricted to the growth in the container. You fertilize the containers once a month, easy maintenance, and you clean them up once a month. Now in the Victorian era, that's when water lilies became very popular. In London, they found that water lilies, if you cut the flowers, they would last for seven to nine days in a vase. Wow. Not only that, they found that all of the tropical water lilies are very, very fragrant. So everybody was the rage to go out and buy water lilies and cut them and bring them into your apartments in London or wherever. Well, then this excitement grew 
and more and more people, of course, love water lilies. And today it's so popular also because of Monet. He loved to paint the water lilies because of the light and the reflections. Now, there are two kinds of water lilies. You have the hardy water lilies, uh, which of course come back year after year. The tropical water lilies you have to plant when the, when the water temperature reaches 70 degrees and they will bloom here from June until November. Another thing that's important to know, the color blue, lavender, and purple is a cool color. When you plant it on a pond, normally it's sunny and hot. It has a cooling effect. The hardy water lilies have never been able to be hybridized to have blue, lavender, purple. All the tropicals, you can have all the colors with them. So blue, lavender, and purple is a very popular color. And again, the fragrance. Also, the tropical water lilies have taller stems, which means when they grow up, they reflect in the water better than the flat pads of the hardy with the flat flower on the pads. So that's the biggest difference with water lilies. Now you mentioned marginal plants, right. very important for the water lily garden. You want to not just have water lilies that can become boring and monotonous. Around the edges of your ponds, you want to begin to think about planting marginal plants such as pickerel and the purple pickerel has a beautiful flower that attracts butterflies. Dragonflies love pickerel. So you get all that movement around the garden. Not only do you have that, you have water iris, Japanese water iris. They grow taller. So with the pickerel and the iris, you get a vertical element that then reflects in the water and breaks up the horizontal flow of the water lilies that are all flat and mimic the horizontal plane. So if you go around the garden too, you've got all kinds of interesting plant material like the acorus, which likes a damp area. A stillbees like to be damp and they flower during the summer months. You've got sweet spire. Uh, the Japanese maple can be planted because it's a maple that has roots that will grow around it. So there are a lot of trees and interesting plants. The arrowheads right over there to your right break up a great marginal plant. Everybody is fascinated with these these plants that look like big arrowheads. Right. So you put an arrowhead next to an iris, you got a combination of a vertical finial with the big bowl look of the, the leaf. So with the water garden, we've got a lot of interest that we can create. And again, with a pond like this, it's very large, but still the maintenance is not that great because the water lilies, you feed them one time a month. We normally put a tablet in, north, south, east, and west on the edge of the container. And then the next month we do it again. And that's it, you do a little cleanup and the water lilies perform. Jim, any advice for where we would find aquatic plants? I, I know not every garden center carries them. And, and also, if we have a smaller pond, are there any aquatic plants that we should maybe avoid because they're gonna be too aggressive for, for a small pond? Everything I do now is Google a plant and they'll give you the background of what it is. So if you see a plant that you like and, you, and it says water plants, you should first check and see if it's invasive. Right. And if it says it's invasive, do not plant it. Because believe me, Equisetum horsetails right. is a plant that's inv very invasive. It'll take over. It's neat. It's interesting. You plant it by a pond. It looks great. and People love it. But before they know it, they're saying, how in the world can I get rid of this plant? It's taking over. So if you were to Google Equisetum, you're going to find out horsetail. Do not plant it because it's invasive. So I just caution everybody, there's so many plants right. that you're going to see on the market that you're trying to sell. Check it out first. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jim, thank you so much for spending the day with us. As always, we learned so much from you. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure, Eric. Thank you. Each week we travel the country north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. Gardeners have been using Seven for over 50 years. Seven is designed to kill a wide variety of insects, like Japanese beetles, tomato hornworms, and aphids. Hate the bugs, love the garden. 
7. Available at garden centers near you. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. Jaguar F-Pace. Today we've toured an amazing garden and seen how transformative its water features are. We've also discussed aquatic plants as well as some simple ways that you can introduce water into your garden at home. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at gardensmart.com. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great gardening tips and ideas as we Garden Smart.